Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Asara, Chloe, and Bella. And as always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. And today we're going to get back into summarizing and analyzing book nine of Homer's The Odyssey. And then we're going to read book ten. And without further ado, let's get there. Okay, we're doing the summary and analysis of Book 9 in the One-Eyed Giant's Cave. Summary. After identifying him to the Phoenicians at the feast, Odysseus tells the story of his wanderings. Following the story at Troy, he and his men sailed to Ismaris, the stronghold of the Sassones. With apparent ease, they sacked the city, killed the men, enslaved the women, and joy of rich haul of plunder. Odysseus advises his men to leave immediately with their riches, but they ignore his warnings. The Sassonis gather reinforcements, counterattack, and eventually rout the Greeks. Odysseus and his men retreat by sea, storms blow, blow the ships off course, but they finally arrive at the land of the Lotus Eaters. The inhabitants are not hostile, however, eating the lotus plant causes Odysseus' men to lose memory and all desire to return home. Odysseus barely gets them back to sea. The next stop is the land of the Cyclops, lawless one-eyed giants. One of them, Polyphemus, traps Odysseus and a scouting party in his cave. Only the Greek hero's will wily plan allows escape. And the analysis. Readers should not confuse Odysseus' pride in identifying himself to the Phoenician, the fate. Phaeacian hosts with vanity. One's name and reputation are crucial in the Homeric world. When Odysseus states that his fame has reached the skies, he is merely stating fact, identifying himself. Reputation is of paramount importance in this culture. But his pride is his name, and his name foreshadows Odysseus' questionable judgment in identifying himself during the escape from Polyphemus. The next four books, books 9 through 12, well, we just read. Book 9. Deal with heroes' wanderings and are the most widely known in the epic. Odysseus does not discuss at this point why he was blown off course and unable to return directly to Ithaca. Phemius, the renowned Ithacan bard, outlines the tale early in the Odyssey when he performs the Achaeans' journey home from Troy. The details are not articulated here either, but the story of Ajax's attempted rape of Cassandra in Athena's temple, and the lack of punishment meted out to him by the Greeks would have been well known by Homer's audience. Many critics see Odysseus' wanderings as a series of trials or tests, tests through which the hero attains a certain wisdom and prepares to be a great king as well as a great warrior. If so, then judgment seems to be a key. If Odysseus is to survive, he must ultimately become wise as well as courageous and shrewd. The first test is against the Sassonis. Some scholars suggest that Odysseus raid, raids Ismaris because the Sassonis are allies of the Trojans. Others conclude that he sacks the city simply because it is there. Certainly, piracy and marauding were legitimate professions for Ithacans. At question is not the raid, but Odysseus' men's foolish enough to disregard his, his, his advice. Having gained victory and considerable plunder, Odysseus wants to be on his way. His men, on the other hand, drink and feast as the Sassones gather reinforcements, gr skilled warriors who eventually rout the Greeks. Odysseus loses six men from each of his ships and is lucky to get away by sea. Odysseus Odysseus escape, escapes, but storms and, and a strong north wind drives his ship off course. As he rounds Cape Malia, near Scythera North and slightly west of Crete, he needs only the spring to swing north by northwest, 300 miles or so to be home. The winds drive him home. Nine days later, he reaches the land of the Lotus Eaters. Homeric geography is suspect, but some scholars place this at or near Libya. Students familiar with some of the legends of the Odyssey, but new to the epic itself, might be surprised to see that the section 
on the Lotus Eaters is only about 25 l lines long. Homer has touched on a universal theme, the lure of oblivion through drugs. The Lotus Eaters have no interest in killing the Greeks. The danger is the Lotus and the forgetfulness it causes. This time, Odysseus' judgment prevails and he managed to get his men back to sea before too many are seduced by the honey-sweet fruit that wipes out ambition and memory. The Cyclops, whom the wanderers visit next, contrasts most vividly with the Phaeacians. The Phaeacians once lived near the Cyclops but moved to Scaria to avoid the lawless brutes, while the Phaeacians are civilized and peace-loving. The Cyclops have no laws, no councils, and no interest in civility or hospitality. It is during this period that Odysseus' judgment comes into question. Having feasted on goat meat on, off, on an offshore island, Odysseus and his, his men could move on. However, Odysseus is curious about who lives on the mainland, taking a dozen of his best men, as well as a skin of extremely strong wine that he received from a priest of Apollo. Odysseus sets out to investigate a cavern near the mainland shore. It is the lair of Polyphemus, a cyclops. Discovering abundant food in the cave, the men want to raid it and sail off, but Odysseus insists on staying to try the hospitality of the owner, who proves to be no charming host. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Polyphemus, a son of Poseidon and nearly as powerful as the gods themselves, scoffs at the concepts of hospitality and welcomes his guests by devouring two for supper and trapping <clears throat> the rest inside his cave for later meals. When the Cyclops leaves, Odysseus devises a plan for an olive wood that the giant uses as a club. The Greek fashion <coughs> a pointed lance about a fathom six feet long and charred the point of the hard hardness. When Cyclops returns that night, he downs two more men for supper, and Odysseus offers him the skin's content. The arrogant giant swills down three large bowls full. As he is drinking, the Cyclops demands to know Odysseus' name. The wily hero says that it is nobody, Odysseus the Greek. When the giant passes out, the Greeks immediately seize their opportunity, grind the lance into the Cyclops' single eye, blinding him. The monster screams with pain and cries for help, but when other Cyclops arrive outside and ask who is harming him, Polyphemus can only answer nobody. Nobody's killing me now by far, not by force. The next morning, when Polyphemus blind lets his rams out in the morning, Odysseus and his men ride out with them, tucked under their bellies and using the animals as shields. As Odysseus and his men sail away, however, Odysseus again employs questionable judgment, shouting taunts at the wounded monster, using the Greek's voice to direct his aim. Polyphemus hurls giant boulders after the ship, barely missing. The Odysse then Odysseus assures that his trials will continue by boasting to Polyphemus that it was he, Odyssey, Odysseus of Ithaca, not a nobody, who gouged out the giant's eye. In this instance, Odysseus is not simply showing pride in his good name, but foolish arrogance that allows the monster to identify him. Polyphemus then calls out his, on his father, Poseidon, god of the sea, to avenge him, and a curse repeated by Tiresias as a prophecy by Circe. As a warning, Polyphemus asks Poseidon to see that Odysseus never makes it home. Or if the fates have already determined that he must, then may, then may he arrive late, broken and alone, finding great troubles in his household, with nothing but oceans between him and Ithaca and the god of the sea as his new enemy. Odysseus has paid a hefty price for his pride. That's the end of the summary and analysis. We're going to get into... The reading of book 10. We got Bella rolling around here. She doesn't usually come in. Okay, we're on book 10. The Grace of the Witch. We made our landfall on Aeolia Island, domain of Aeolius Hippotades, the wind king dear to the gods who never die. An isle dr drift upon the sea, ringed around with brazen ramparts on a sheer cliffside. Twelve children had old Aeolus at a home, six daughters and six lusty sons, and he gave girls to boys to be their gentle brides. Now those lords in their parents' company sup every day in 
in hall a royal feast with fumes of sacrifice and winds that pipe round hollow cords, and all the night they sleep on beds of filigree beside their ladies. Here we put in lodged in the town and palace, while Aeolus played host to me. He kept me one full month to hear the tale of Troy, the ships and the return of the Achaeans, all of which I told in point by point in order. When in return I asked his leave to sail and asked provisioning, he stinted nothing, adding a bull's hide sewn from neck to tail into a mighty bag, bottling storm winds from for Zeus had long ago made Aeolus, warden of winds, to rouse or calm at will. He wedged this bag under my afterdeck, lashing the neck with shining silver wire, so not a breath got through, only the west wind. He lofted for me in a quartering breeze to take my squadron spanking home. No luck, the fair wind failed us when our, we, when our produce failed. Nine days and nights we sailed without event till on the tenth we raised our land. We neared it and saw men building fires along the shore, but now, being weary to the bone, I fell into deep slumber. I had worked the sheet nine days alone and given it to no one, wishing to spill no wind on the homeward run. But while I slept, the crew began to parley. Silver and gold, they guessed, were in that bag, bestowed on me by Aeolus' great heart. And one would glance at his benchmate and say, it never fails. He's welcome everywhere. Hail to the captain when he goes ashore. He brought along so many presents, plunder out of Troy, that's it. How's about ourselves, his shipmates all the way? Nigh home we are with empty hands. And who is gift from Aeolus he has. I say we ought to crack that bag. There's gold and silver plenty in that bag. Temptation had its way with my companions, and they untied the bag. Then every wind roared into Hort Hurricane, and the ships went pitching. West, with many cries, our land was lost. Roused up despairing in that gloom, I thought, should I go over, overside for a quick finish, or clench my teeth and stay among the living? Down in the bilge I lay, pulling my sea cloak over my head while the rough gale blew the ship, and rueful crews clear back to Aeola. We put ashore for water, then all hands gathered out alongside for a midday meal. When we had taken bread and drink, I picked one soldier and one herald to go with me, and called again on Aeolus. I found him at meet with his young princess and his lady, but there beside the pillars and his portico, we sat down silent at the open door. Without, without spinning it there. The night amazed them, and they all exclaimed, Why back again, Odysseus? What sea friend, excuse me, what sea fiend rose in your path? Did we not launch you well for home or for whatever land you chose? Out of melancholy, I replied, Mischief aboard, nodding at the Tiller, damn throws did for me. Make good my loss, dear friends. You have the power, gently I pleaded. But they turned cold and still, said Father Aeolus, take yourself out of this island, creeping thing. No law or no wisdom lays it on me now, to help a man the blessed gods detest. Oh, your voyage here was cursed by heaven. He drove me from the place, grown as I would, and comfortless as... We went again to sea. Days of it till the men flagged at the oars. No breeze, no help in sight. By our own folly, six indistinguishable nights and days before we raised the last Rigonian height and far stronghold of Lemos. In that lead, the daybreak follows dusk, and so the shepherd homing calls to the cowherd setting out, and he who never slept could earn two wages, tending ox and pasturing silvery flocks. Where the night, low night path of the sun is near, the sun's path by day, here then we found a curious bay with mountain walls of stone, to left and right and reaching far inland, a narrow entrance opening from the sea, where cliffs converged as though to touch and close, all of my squadron sheltered here inside the cavern of this bay. Black prow by prow, those hulls were made fast in a limpid calm, without a ripple, Stillness all around them. My own black ship I chose to moor alone on the seaside using a rock for bollard and climbed a rocky point to get to get my bearings. No farms, no cultivated land appeared, but puffs of smoke rose in the wilderness. 
So I sent out two picked men and a herald to learn what race of men this land sustained. My party found a trick, a wagon road, for bringing wood down from the heights to town. And near the settlement they met a daughter of Antiphatus, the last dragon, a stalwart young girl taking her pail to Artechia, the fountain where these people go for water. My fellows hailed her, put their questions to her, who might the king be ruling over whom? She waved her hand, showing her father's lodge, so they approached it. In its gloom they saw a woman like a mountain crag, the queen, and loathed the sight of her. But she, for greeting, called from the meeting ground her lord and the master, Antiphatus, who came to drink their blood. He seized one man and tore him on the spot, making a meal of him the other two, leapt out of doors and ran to join the ships. Behind he raised the whole tribe, howling countless last three gones, and more than men they seemed gigantic when they gathered on the sky line to shoot great boulders down from slings and hell's own, crushing rows and crying from the ships, as planks and men were smashed to bits, poor gobbets, the, wilder, the wild men speared like fish and bore away, but long before it ended in the anchorage, havoc and slaughter, I had drawn my sword and cut my own ship's cable. Man, I shouted, man the oars and pull till your hearts break. If you would put this butchery behind, the oarsmen rent the sea in mortal fear, and my ship spurted out of range, far out from that deep canyon, where the rest were lost. So we fared onward and death fell behind, and we took breath to grieve for our com companions. Our next landfall was on Aea, on Aea, island of Kirky, dire beauty and of divine, sister of baleful Aetis, like him, fathered by Helios, the light of mortals, or on Percy, child of the ocean stream. We came, washed in our silent ship upon her shore, and found a cove, a haven for the ship. Some god invisible conned us in. We landed to lie down in that place two days and nights, worn out and sick at heart, tasting our grief. But when dawn set another day is shining, I took my spear and broadsword, and I climbed a rocky point above the ship for sight or sound of human labor. Gazing out from that high place over a land of thickets, oaks and wide watercourses, I could see a smoke west from the woodland hall of Kirky. So I took counsel with myself. Should I go inland, scouting out that reddish smoke? And No, better not, I thought, but first return to waterside and ship and give the men breakfast before I sent them to explore. Now as I went down quite alone, it came a bow shot from the ship, some god's companion. Set a big buck in motion to cross my path. A stag with noble antlers pacing down from pasture in the woods to the riverside. His long thirst and the power of sun constrained him. He started from the bush and wheeled. I hit him square in the spine midway along his back. And the bronze point broke through it. In the dust he fell and whinnied as life bled away. I set one foot against him, pulling hard to wrench my weapon from the hand wound and left the butt end on the ground. I plucked some with these and twined a double strand into a rope, enough to tie the hawks of my huge trophy. Then pick a back, I lugged him to the ship, Le leaning on my long spear sh shaft. I could not haul that mighty carcass on one shoulder. Beside the ship, I let him drop, and spoke gently and load each man standing here. Come, friends, Though hard beset, will not go down into the house of death before our time. As long as food and drink remain aboard, let us rely on it, not die of hunger. At this, those faces cloaked in desolation upon the waste sea beach were barred. Their eyes turned toward me in the mighty trophy, light, lighting for seeing pleasure one by one. So hands were washed to take what heaven sent us. And all that day until the sun went down, we had our full of venison and wine, till after the sunset and the gathering dusk. We slept at last above the line of breakers, when the young dawn with fingertips of rose made heaven bright, I called them round and said. Excuse me. Shipmates, companions in disastrous time. Oh, my dear friends, where dawn lies in the west, and where the great sunlight of men may go under the earth by night, and where he rises... Of these things we know nothing. Do we know any 
least thing to serve us now? I wonder. All that I saw when I went up to the up the rock was one more island and the boundless main, a low landscape covered with woods and scrub and puffs of smoke ascending in mid-forest. They were all silent, but their hearts contracted. Remembering Antiphatus, Antiphatus, excuse me, the last dragon, and that prodigious cannibal, the Kyclops, they cried out, and the salt tears wet their eyes. But seeing one our time for action lost in weeping, I mustered those Achaeans under arms, counting them off in two platoons, myself, my godlike Eurych, Locos commanding, we shook lots in a soldier's dogskin cap, and his came bounding out, and his came bounding out, valiant Eurycloas. So off he went, with twenty two companions, weeping as mine wept, wept too, who stayed behind. In the wild wood they found an open glade around a smooth stone house. The hall of Kirky and wolves and mountain lions lay there, mild in her soft. Soft spell fed on her drug of evil. None would attack, oh, it was strange, I tell you. But switching their long tails, they faced our men like hounds. You'd look up when they ma their master comes with tidbits for, for them as he will. From table, humbly those wolves and lions with mighty paws fawned on our own men who met their yellow eyes and feared them. In the entrance the way they stayed to listen there, inside her quiet house they heard the goddess Kirky. Lo, the sh she sang in her beguiling voice, while on her loom she wove ambrosial fabric sheer and bright by that craft known to the goddesses of heaven. No one would speak until Polites, most faithful and likable of my officers, said, Dear friends, no need for stealth. Here's a young weaver singing a pretty song to set the air, a tingle on these lawns. And paving courts, goddess she is, O oh lady, shall we greet her? So reassured, they all cried out together, and she came swiftly to the shining doors to call them all but Eurylochus, who shared a snare. The innocents went after her, a throne she seated them in lounging chairs while she prepared a meal of cheese and barley and amber honey mixed with pram and wine, adding her own vile pinch to make them lo lose desire or thought of our dear fatherland, scarce had they drunk when she flew after them with her long stick and shut them in a pigsty, bodies, voices, heads and bristles all, swinish now, though minds were still unchanged, so squealing and all they went, and Kirky tossed them acorns mast and cornel berries fodder for hogs who rut and slumber on the earth. Down to the ship, Yuri Locos came running to cry alarm, foul magic doomed his men, but working with dry lips to speak a word he could not, being so shaken, blinding tears welled in his eyes, forbode and filled his heart. When we were frantic questioning him at last, we heard the tale our friends were gone, said he. We went up through the oak scrub where you sent us, Odysseus' glory of commanders, until we found a palace and a glade, a marble house on open ground, and someone singing before her loom a chill sweet song, goddess a girl, we could not tell. They hailed her, and then she stepped through shining doors and said, Come, come in, like sheep they followed her, but I saw cruel deceit and stayed behind. She's gonna get me in trouble. Then all our fellows vanished, not a sound and nothing stirred, although I watched for hours. When I heard this I slung my silver hilted broadsword on and shuddered and shouldered my long bow and said, Come, come take my me back the way you came, but he put both his hands round my knees to desperate woe and said in supplication. Not back there, oh my lord, oh leave me here, you even you cannot return, I know it. I know you cannot bring away our shipmates, better make sail with these men quickly too, and save ourselves from horror while we may. But I replied, by heaven your Clovis, rest here then take food and wine, stay in the back hall's shelter, let me go, as I see nothing for it but to go. I turned and left him, left the shore and ship, and went up through the woodland, hushed and shady, to find the subtle witch in her long hall. But Hermes met me with his golden wand, barring the way a boy whose lips was downy in the first bloom of manhood. So he seemed, he took my hand and spoke as though he knew me. Why take the inland path alone, 
poor seafarer by hill and dale, upon this island all unknown, your friends are locked in Kirky's pale, all are become like swine to sea, and if you go to set them free, you go to stay and never more make sail, fair old home upon Thaki. But I can tell you what to do to come unchanged from Kirky's power and disenthrall your fighting crew. Take with you to her bower as amulet this plan I know. It will defeat her horrid show, so pure and potent is the flower. No mortal herb was ever so, your cup with numbing drops of night. And evil still of all remorse, she will infuse to charm your sight. But this great herb with holy force will keep your mind and senses clear. When she turns cruel coming near, with her long stick to whip you out of doors, then let your cutting blade appear. Let instant death upon it shine, and she will cower and yield her mid, a pleasure you must not decline. So make, may her lust and fear be stead, you and your friends, and break her spell. But make her swear by heaven and hell, no witch's tricks or else your harness shed. You'll be unmanned by her as well. He bent down glittering for the magic plant and pulled it up, black root and milky flower. A Malu in the language of the gods, fatigue and pain for mortals to uproot. But gods do this and everything with ease. Then toward Olympus, through the island trees, Hermes departed, and I sought out Kirky. My heart high with excitement beating hard, before her mansion in the porch, I stood to call her, all being still. Quick as a cat, she opened her bright doors and sighed a welcome, then I strode after her with heavy heart. Down the long hall and took the chair she gave me, silver studded, intricately carved, made with a low foot rest, the lady Kirky, mixed me a golden cup of honeyed wine, adding it in mischief her unholy drug. I drank and she and the fa drink failed, but she came forward, aiming a stroke with her long stick and whispered, Dawn in the sty, and snore among the rest. Without a word I drew my sharpened sword, and in one bound held it against her throat, she cried out, then slid under to take my knees, catching her breath to stay in her distress. What champion of what country can you be? Where are your kinsmen and your city? Are you not sluggish with my wine? I wonder never a mortal man that drank this cup. But when it passed his lips he had succumbed. Hail must your heart be in your tempered will. Odysseus then you are, O great commander, excuse me, O great contender of whom the glittering god with golden wand spoke to me ever, and foretold the black swift ship would, would carry you from Troy, put up your weapon in the sheath. We too shall mingle and make love upon our bed. So mutual trust may come out of play, come of play in love. To this I said, Kirky, am I a boy, that you should make me soft and doting now? Here in this house you turned my men to swine, and now it is I myself you hold, ticing into your chamber to your dangerous bed, to make my manhood when you have me stripped, I but to take my manhood when you have me stripped, I mount no love bed of love with you upon it, or swear me first a great oath if I do, you'll work no more enchantment in my harm. To my harm. She swore at once, outright as I demanded, and after she had sworn and bound herself, I entered Kirky's flawless bed of love. Presently in the hall her maids were busy, the nymphs who waited upon Kirky for whose cradles or in fountains under boughs, or in the glassy seaward gliding streams. One came with richly colored rugs to throw on seats and chair back. Over linen covers, a second pulled the tables out, all silver and loaded, then with baskets all of gold. A third mixed wine as tawny, mild as honey, and a bright bowl and settled golden cups. The fourth came bearing water and lit a blaze under a cauldron. By and by it bubbled, and when the Dazzling, brazen, besseled seeds, she built a bathtub to my waist and bathed me, pouring a s soothing blend on head and shoulders, warming the soreness on my joints away. When she had done and smoothed me with sweet oil, she put a tunic and a cloak around me and took me to a silver-studded chair with footrest all elaborately carven. Now came a maid to tip a golden jug of water into a silver finger bowl and draw a polished table to my side. The larder mistress brought her straight tray of lo loaves with many savory slices, and she gave the best to tempt me. 
but no pleasure came. I huddled with my mind elsewhere. Oppressed, Kirky regarded me as there I sat disconsolate and never touched a crust. Then she stood over me and chided me. Why sit at a table, mute? Odysseus, are you in mistrustful of my bread and drink? Can it be treachery that you fear again? After the gods' great oath, I swore for you. I turned to her at once and said, Kirky, where is the captain who could bear too much, who could bear to touch this banquet in my place? A decent man would see his company before him drink. Put heart in me to eat and drink. You may be by freeing my companions. I must see them. But Kirky had already turned away, her long staff in her hand. She left the hall and opened up my, the sty. I saw her sent her enter, driving those men towards swine to stand before me. She stroked them each in turn with some new chrism, and then, behold, their bristles fell away. The coarse pelt grown upon them by her drug melted away. And they were men again, younger, more handsome, taller than before. Their eyes upon me, each one took my hands. And while the regret and longing pierced them through, so the room rang with sobs, and even Kirky pitied that transformation, exquisite. The goddesses, goddess looked as she stood near me, saying, Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus' master, mariner, and soldier. Go to the sea beach and sea-breasting ships, drag it ashore, full of length upon the land, stow gear, and stores and rock holes under cover. Return, be quick, bring all your dear companions. Now, being a man, I could not help consenting, so I went down to the sea beach and the ship where I found all my other men on board, weeping in despair along the benches, sometimes in farmyards when the cows return, well fed from pastures to the barn. One sees the pens give way before the calves in tumult, breaking through to cluster about their mothers, Bumping together, bawling just that way. My crew poured round me when they saw me come, their faces wet with tears as if they saw their homeland, and the crags of Ithaca, even the very town where they were born, and weeping. Still they all cried out in greeting, Prince, what joy there this is, this is your safe return. Now Ithaca comes here, and now Ithaca seems here, and we, we in Ithaca, but tell us now what death befell our friends. And speaking gently, I replied, first we must get the ship high on the shingle and stow our gear and stores in clefts of rock for cover. Then come follow me to see your shipmates in the magic house of Kirky, eating and drinking endlessly regaled. They turned back as commanded to this work, only one lagged and tried to hold the others. Eurycloas, 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 Locus it was, who blurted out, Where now, poor remnants, it is, is it devil's work? You long for, will you go to Kirky's Hall? Swine, wolves, and lions, she will make us all. Beasts of her courtyard, bound by her enchantment. Remember those the Kyclops held. Remember shipmates who made the that visit with Odysseus. That da the daring man they died for his foolishness. When I heard this, I had a mind to draw. The blade that swung against my side and chop him, bowling his head upon the ground. Kinsman, no kinsman, close to me though he was. But others came between saying to stop me. Prince, we can leave him if you say the word. Let me stay here on ground as, ours, as for ourselves, show us the way to Kirky's magic hall. So all turned inland, leaving shore and ship. In Muri Locus, he too came on behind, bearing the rough edge of my tongue. Meanwhile, as Kirky's hands, the rest were gently bathed, anointed with sweet oil and dressed afresh in tunics and new clo cloaks with fleecy li linings. We found them all at supper when we came, but greeting their old friends once more, the crew could not hold back their tears, and now again the rooms rang with sobs. Then Kirky, loveliest of all immortals, came to counsel me. Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus' master, mariner, and soldier, enough of weeping fits, I know I too, what you endured upon the inhuman sea, what odds you met on land from hostile men, remain with me and share my meat and wine. Restore behind your ribs those gallant hearts that served you in the old days when you sailed from stony Ithaca, now parched and spent your cruel wandering is all you think of, never of joy after so many blows. As we were men, we could not help consenting, so day by day we lingered, feasting long on roasts and wine until a year grew fat. But when the passing months and wheedling reed seasons 
brought the long summery days, the pause of the summer, my shipmates one day summoned me and said, Captain, shake off this trance and think of home. If home indeed it awaits us, if we shall ever see your own well-timbered halls on Ithaca. They made me feel a pang, and I agree. That day and all day long, from dawn to sundown, we feasted on roast meat and ruddy wine. Now at the sunset, when the dusk came on, my men slept in the shadowy hall, but I went through the dark to Kirky's flawless bed and took the goddess's knees in supplication, urging as she bent to hear. O oh, Kirky, now you must keep your promise. It is time. Help me make sail for home day after day. My longing quickens and my company give me no peace, but wear my heart away, pleading when you are not at hand to hear. The loveliest of goddesses replied, Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, you shall not stay here longer against your will, but home you may not go unless you make a, take a strange way round and come to the cold homes of death and pale Persephone. You shall hear prophecy from the rapt shade of blind Tereses of Thebes, forever charged with reason, among, even among the dead, to him alone of all the flitting ghosts. Persephone's has given a mind un darkened. At this I felt a weight like stone within me, and moaning pressed my length against the bed, with no desire to see the daylight more. But when I had wept and tossed and had my fill of this despair, at last I answered her, Kirky, who pilots me upon this journey, no man has ever sailed to the land of death, that loveliest of goddesses replied. Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master of landways and sea ways, feel no dismay because you lack a pilot only set up your mast and haul your canvas to the fresh blowing north. Sit down and steer and hold that wind even to the bourne of ocean. Persephone's deserted strand and grove, dusky with poplars and the drooping willow, run through the tide rip. Bring your ship to shore, land there, and find the crumbling homes of death. Here, toward the sorrowing water, run the streams of wailing out of sticks and quenchless burning torrents that Join in thunder at the rock. Here then, great soldier, setting foot obey me. Dig a well shaft of a four-armed square. Pour out libations, rounded to the unnumbered dead. Sweet milk and honey, then sweet wine, and last clear water. Scattering handfuls of white barley. Pray now with all your heart to the faint dead. Swear you will sacrifice your finest heifer at home in Ithaca. And burn for them. Her tenderest parts and sacrifice and vow to the Lord of Tiresias, apart from all a black lamb, handsomest of all your flock, thus to appease the na nations of the dead. Then slash a black ewe's throat and a black ram, facing the gloom of Eurebus, but turn your head away, head away toward ocean. You shall not see now souls of the buried dead and shadowy hosts, and now you must call out to your companion to flay those sheep the bronze knife has cut down. For offerings burnt flesh to those below, to sovereign death and pale Persephone. Meanwhile, draw a sword from hip, crouch down, ward off the surging phantoms from the bloody pit. Until you know the presence Tiresias, he will come soon, great captain, be it he who gives you course and distance for your sailing, homeward across the cold fish breeding sea. As the goddess ended, Dawn came stitched in gold. Now Kirky dressed me in my shirt and cloak, put on a gown of subtle tissue, silvery, then wound a golden belt about her waist and veiled her head in linen while I went through the hall to rouse my crew. I bent above each one and gently said, Wake from your sleep no more, sweet slumber. Come, we sail the Lady Kirky. So ordains it. They were soon up and ready at the word that word. But I was not to take my men unharmed from this place, even from this, among them all. The youngest was Elf Elpener, no mainstay in a fight, nor very clever, and this one, having climbed on Kirky's roof to taste the cool night, fell asleep with wine. Waked by a morning of voices and the tramp of men below, he started up and missed his footing on the long, steep backward ladder and fell that height headlong. The blow smashed the nape cord and his ghost fled to the dark. But I was outside, walking with the rest, saying, Homeward you think we must be sailing to our land? No. Elsewhere in the voyage, Kirky is laid upon me. We must go to the cold homes of death and pale Persephone to hear Tiresias tell of time to come. 
They fell so stricken upon hearing this, they sat down, wailing aloud, loud, and tore their hair. But nothing came of giving way to grief. Down to the shore and ship at last we went, bowed with anguish, cheeks all wet with tears, to find that Kirky had been there before us and tied nearby a black ewe and a ram. She had gone by like air, for who could see the passage of a goddess unless she wished his mortal eyes aware? That's the end of book ten. We are going to stop there, obviously. And in the next video, we are going to summarize and analyze book ten. We'll be on to book eleven, and that's A Gathering of Shades. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit that notification bell. And as always, stay safe and healthy, and you have a great night. Thank you.